Poštovani gledalci, dobrodošli u emisiju Granice Istoka. Ja sam Harun Karčić. Iako na nedavnim evropskim parlamentarnim izborima desno orijentisane populističke stranke nisu dobile očekivane rezultate, ne treba ih zanemariti. Nekada marginalne, danas su postale dio mainstreama evropske političke scene i uspjele su okupiti znatan broj sljedbenika, naglašavajući pitanja evropskog identiteta, zajedničkih kolektivnih interesa i navodnu opasnost od islama, izbjeglica i terorizma. Zanimljivo je da mnogi od tih desno orijentisanih stranaka njeguju bliske veze sa Rusijom. U ovom izdanju emisije analiziramo šta je to što spaja evropske desničare i Rusiju pod vodstvom Vladimira Putina. Prije razgovora sa našim gostima, pogledajmo uvodni prilog o rastu desničarskog populizma u Evropskoj uniji. Evropsku desnicu čini širok spektar političkih stranaka, od populista i nacionalista do ekstremih neofašista. U mnogim državama desnica je u usponu na političkoj sceni, a njena popularnost u porastu. Naročito su zanimljivi se prisni odnosi između Rusije i evropskih desničara. Razlog tome je što i jedni i drugi vide korist od strateškog približavanja. Evropski desničari su razočarani evropskim liberalizmom i krive ga za brojne probleme, od priljeva izbjeglica i sigurnosnih problema do ekonomijskih. Također, euroskeptici protive se centralizaciji Evropske unije i žele smanjiti ulogu NATO-a u Evropi. Mnogi njeguju i divljenje prema Vladimiru Putinu te njegovoj poluautoritativnoj vladavini i konzervativizmu. Rusiju smatraju alternativnim geopolitičkim saveznikom. Sa druge strane, iz pozicije Moskve, napredovanje desničarskih populista ide u Rusiju korist jer oni mogu poljuljati temelje Evropske unije. Akcentiranje centralizovane birokratije Unije, njene porozne granice, prijetnja od terorizma, navodna opasnost od muslimana i prigljeva migranata, sve su to teme koje spajaju Rusiju i evropske desničare. Cilj ruske podrške desničarskim populistima je dodatno polarizirati društvo i amplificirati postojeće društvene podjele. Razbijanjem evropskog konsenzusa o ključnim pitanjima i akcentiranjem podjela, Evropska unija postaje slabija, a Rusiji odgovara upravo slabija i rasparčana unija te slabiji transatlanski savez. Proteklih godina, brojni desničarski populisti su se sastali sa ruskim zvanečnicima dok su ruski mediji o njima afirmativno izvještavali. Italijanska stranka Liga nekada je bila marginalna, a danas je dominanta stranka na italijanskoj političkoj sceni. Njen čelik Bateo Salvini otvoreno podržava ruskog predsjednika Vladimira Putina. U Velikoj Britaniji Nigel Farage uspio je prekinuti veze Velike Britanije sa Evropskom unijom. On je bio i rijetki evropski političar koji je Vladimiru Putinu čestitao u aneksiju Krima 2014. godine. U Francuskoj Marine Le Pen i njen nacionalni front postali su mainstream stranka. Ruski provladni mediji je otvoreno podržavaju kao i banke bliske Putinu. Putinova politička stranka podržava i Austrijsku slobodarsku stranku s kojom je potpisala petogodišnji ugovor o saradnji. Nedavno je Austrijska vlada pala zbog otkrića korupcijskog skandala između vođe čelnika slobodarske stranke i predstavnika ruskog oligarha bliskog Putinu. Rusija će u budućnosti vjerovatno nastaviti njegovati bliske odnose sa evropskim populistima, naročito desničarskim. Gledano iz vizure Moskve, podjela Evropske unije je njihov strateški, geopolitički i sigurnosni cilj, jer slabija Evropska unija znači snažniju Rusiju. Detaljnije o vezama Rusije sa evropskim desničarima, ali i nacionalistima na Balkanu, pojašnjava nam britanski istoričar Marko Atila Hoare, Marco Helen, welcome to the Al Jazeera Balkans channel. Hello, thank you. Yeah. Now, uh, the recent EU parliamentary elections once again raised questions about Russian interference, with many Europeans asking themselves to what extent is their democratic choice undermined by Russian money and disinformation campaigns? What is your take on that? Yes, that definitely is very much, much, much a risk. So the, the Russian regime under Vladimir Putin has a systematic policy of supporting those elements, particularly on the populist right, but also on the populist left that are anti-liberal, opposed to the center, opposed to the mainstream, and that seek to uh, undermine Euro-Atlantic institutions. So this is a systematic policy by Russia to, to do, is to, to sow so discord in the West, essentially. Mm -hmm. What exactly is Russia trying to achieve by doing so? Well, Putin is a um, former KGB officer. He was very much angry at the collapse of the Soviet Union, so there's an element of revanchism, uh, a resentment of the Soviet Union's Cold War defeat. Um, but more, that's his emotional background. Mm -hmm. the, more, the more immediate uh, factor is that he wants to undermine institutions that he feels are working against Russia to increase Russia's influence and to try and undermine those institutions that are restricting that influence that he sees as a threat, so the European Union and NATO in, in particular. 
this has interests for him. He can, for example, support populists that oppose sanctions against Russia, so to allow him more, more leeway to pursue his own policy. Um, he wants to undermine those that push for liberal interventionism. He wants to be able to support his allies, for example, in Syria, mm -hmm. or to um, be able to intervene in neighbors like Georgia and Ukraine without incurring resistance from the West. So he has his interest in uh, backing those factions that are likely to agree with him on these, on these questions. Yeah, but looking from the, from the perspective of, of European right-wing right populists, mm -hmm. why do they see Putin as an ally? Mm -hmm. They are very, um, if you like, say, tunnel visioned in terms of what their priorities are. They don't like the liberal centre. Uh, they don't like the sort of what they consider mainstream politicians, and they want to um, overthrow that existing order. So, for example, in, in Britain, the populist right wants to leave the European Union. Um, consequently, they will be happy to get help from Putin. They see him as an ally with the same enemy as them. Mm -hmm. But why has a right wing populism in Europe, in Europe been rising over the past mm -hmm. decade? Mm -hmm. So we have um, a number of factors there. The general discontent, the fact that the liberal order hasn't worked for everybody. So even in Britain, which was a prosperous country until about 10 years ago, doing very well economically, you had um, a lot of people left, left out of the success, left behinds. Um, there's a sense that the elites aren't responsive to public opinion, um, that they don't listen to ordinary voters, and they just do, do their own thing. There's um, issues in immigration. So the, the increase in immigration has created a bit of a uh, racist backlash, you might like to call it, or populist backlash. So they um, want politicians who will restrict immigration. Um, and this allows populists to feed off these sentiments and to try and pursue their own careers in this, mm -hmm. in this manner. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the Balkans, uh, why has Russia stepped up its support for Balkan nationalists over the past decade? And do you see it as, as a threat to EU and NATO mm -hmm. integration? Yes, very much so. So the, the Balkans is a battleground which the, um, Russia can use to try and obstruct NATO expansion and the EU expansion. So they have an interest in seeing these conflicts unresolved, keeping the Kosovo-Serbia dispute unresolved, keeping Bosnia unstable, keeping the Macedonia-Greece uh, conflict unresolved. Um, that gives them an, a way of exerting influence um, by supporting those who are obstructing a re resolution. Um, and that means they can try and stop these countries getting into NATO. So as long as Kosovo and Serbia are at loggerheads, it, it reduces the chance that Serbia will ever join the European Union, mm -hmm. um, eventually NATO too. Yeah, and support from Moscow is widespread among Bosnian Serbs and Serbians alike. Uh, why would ordinary people uh, readily jump on Russia's bandwagon? And what does Russia have to offer Bosnian Serbs and Serbia Serbians alike that the West cannot? I think it's hardly ordinary people are concerned. It's perhaps exaggerated. I mean, I, I lived in Serbia for two years. My feeling was that at the ordinary level, ordinary Russian Serbs weren't particularly didn't particularly love Russians at a personal level. They tended to see them as, if anything, let, let lower than themselves. Um, but the nationalist standpoint, Russia is kind of attractive. You know, there's a history of Serbia and Russia's allies in the First World War in particular, the Second World War. Um, and pan-Slavic ties and orthodoxy. Pan-Slavic yeah. ties, this whole ideology of pan-Slavism, um, whereas they saw NATO as the enemy which bombed them in 1999. So for nationalistic reasons, there's that attraction. It allows opposition politicians to play, play upon that to get support. Um, whereas as far as the, the government, government of Serbia is concerned, um, Vucic, for example, well, he's not going to get into uh, NATO, he doesn't want to necessarily want to get into NATO, but the European Union, for example, soon, he's going to be kept out a long time. So he's every interest in trying to develop ties in both directions to appease the na nationalist right while maintaining a balance, in, which gives them some freedom of maneuver in mm -hmm. the world. Well, it's interesting, despite all the rhetoric uh, for in Belgrade, um, the Serbian military has carried out a higher, uh, more military exercises with, with NATO than with Russia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, ultimately Serbia's uh, uh, economic natural ties are with, with, with the West and uh, with Europe. That's the natural sphere which Serbia inhabits. Russia is far away. It doesn't have much to offer e economically, so it's natural that Serbia will want to accommodate itself to the West. Mm -hmm. It has NATO allies, all around, NATO countries all around it, so that makes sense. Yeah. Now, it's interesting that Kremlin-backed banks now own a 47% share in uh, Croatian giant Agricor. Uh, this deal gave President Putin an indirect leverage over the Croatian economy. Uh, but Croatia is both a NATO and EU member state. Why would Moscow, why has Moscow not given up on Croatia? Mm -hmm. Why is it still trying to assert, assert its influence mm -hmm. in a country which is both a NATO and EU member state? Mm -hmm. Well, Putin's plan is very ambitious and he certainly doesn't limit, him, doesn't limit himself to countries that are outside um, NATO and the EU. So, for example, he supported Trump's campaign against Hillary Clinton. He tried to um, prevent Clinton from winning. He supported Brexit. 
So he'll quite happily meddle in internal affairs. He supports Le Pen in France, he gives her her money, and she re reciprocated by supporting the annexation of Crimea by, by Russia. So he has every in, in, in interest in building links even with existing existing members, and there are those on the Croatian right who are receptive to such mm -hmm. um, approaches. Yeah, but do you see a, a similar pattern with, uh, when it comes to Moscow's influence in other EU member states such as Slovakia, uh, Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Czech Republic? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Everywhere in these countries, there, there are all, always those um, uh, populist right-wing elements that are receptive, that are uh, skeptical about too much integration of the European Union and um, anti-liberal, and therefore there's always room for, for put into to play upon these differences. Mm -hmm. Now, over the last couple of years, uh, in Moscow has been uh, Closing up to, to Bosnian Serbs and to Serbia, uh, Serbians alike, but we have seen Moscow develop close relations with the Croatian Democratic Party, the HDZ. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you explain that? Mm -hmm. um, well, the HDZ is also quite uh, has a, a, a extreme right wing populist uh, wing. It um, those who are pro Ustasha or who, are, for example, anti gay, the homophobia of the Croatian right is very strong. So there's some common ground there. There's also common ground over Bob Bosnia. So just as Dodik would like to partition Bosnia and ultimately to separate Republika Srpska from Bosnia, so there are those on the Croatian right who would like to also establish a third entity uh, to carve that out of Bosnia. Um, so there's certainly elements there for cooperation between Russia, uh, Republika Srpska, Belgrade and, and Zagreb. Mm -hmm. Marko, it was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Poštovani gledalci, bio je to Marko Tila Huare, britanski historičar i profesor na Sarajevskoj školi za nauku i tehnologiju. Religija je važan faktor u oblikovanju identiteta Evropljana i znatno utječe na njihove političke stavove. Detaljnije u nastavku. Prije početka izbjegličke krize, širom Evrope jačala je popularnost desničarskih stranaka. Danas su u mnogim zemljama dio koalicijskih vlada. Slijedi kratki pregled desničarske scene u Evropskoj uniji.
detaljnije o rastu desničarskih pokreta u Americi i Evropi pojašnjava nam John Cox sa Univerziteta u Sjevernoj Karolini. John, hello and welcome to the Al Jazeera Balkans channel. Now, the threat from violent right-wing extremism in the, in the United States and mm -hmm. Europe has been rising over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, of particular concern are white supremacists and uh, anti-government extremists. Mm -hmm. uh, does this have much to do with the election of Donald Trump? And do you see a correlation between the two? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, actually, I see kind of a, uh, what I'd call a dialectical correlation. That is, in the sense that I think Trump's election itself is an example of the strength and uh, persistence of uh, racism and white supremacy in the United States, which makes it possible for many white people uh, who are maybe members of the working class or the lower middle class are capable of actually believing that Donald Trump is their friend because, again, uh, the, the centuries of racism have taught uh, uh, many white people, not all white people, fortunately, but has taught many of them that they have more in common with other white people and so on and that they should be in a state of fear and hysteria and panic over um, increasing immigration and things of that sort. So I'd say that um, on the one hand, so I think that that helped to produce Trump, that is a long history of racism that hasn't gone away, but then also his election has also led to an encouragement and a promotion of right-wing radicalism and violence. And so I think there's no doubt when uh, when you have the most powerful person in the U.S. and in fact perhaps the most powerful person in the world openly promoting and fanning the flames of uh, Islamophobia, of racism, of all sorts of xenophobia, um, that it definitely has led to uh, an increase in incidents of the sort that we saw two summers ago in Charlottesville. But also there are many organizations that track right-wing extremism and violence and hate crimes and so on, and they have all found uh, substantial increases in, um, in racist incidents and mm -hmm. violence. But why mm -hmm. haven't we, we seen much more political opposition to President Donald mm -hmm. Trump and his and the rising right-wing movement in the U.S.? Yeah, well, I would say that fortunately there is, some, there is substantial opposition, but it's rather decentralized and it's not necessarily visible. Uh, or, uh, 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 some manifestations are quite visible. For example, the fact that on his very first day in office, we had the largest day of coordinated mass mobilizations in the history of the, the, the United States. Uh, the first women's march of January 21st, 2017. It exceeded in numbers even the largest mobilizations against the war in Vietnam, uh, you know, 50 years ago. So there has been a lot of opposition. Uh, a lot of it, though, is not very well coordinated. And I think a lot of times um, people look for opposition maybe in the electoral or political arena. There is certainly opposition within there, but I think that there's much more vibrant and effective opposition uh, among like uh, uh, you know, mass movements and, and student protest movements and things of that yeah. sort. Now, what is the connection between right-wing politicians in the U.S. and Christian evangelicals, and how does that relate to their staunch support for Israel? Yeah, well, there is, especially going back to the 1980s, probably going back much further than that, but from the Reagan years onward, and that was the origins of something called the New Right, when there was a more visible and, uh, uh, you know, alliance between people who called themselves Christian evangelicals mm -hmm. and right-wing, uh, uh, you know, politicians and so yeah. on. Um, a lot of this is an extremely confused form of politics. When you have people like Donald Trump, for example, now claiming to be a Christian and to be some great exemplar of Christianity, it's rather absurd, and he occasionally, sometimes, to try to impress an audience of Christian evangelicals, he'll try to make some reference to the Bible, and it will come out all wrong because mm -hmm. it's hard for him to pull off that act for m much time. Um, but nonetheless, uh, anyway, there are many Christians in the U.S. who are, are opposed to racism, right-wing uh, uh, politics, and so on. Uh, but many of them don't call themselves evangelicals. In fact, there are some of them, including in my state of North Carolina, uh, for several years, uh, one of the most powerful protest, uh, like progressive protest movements has been led by, by Christians, people who call themselves the uh, Moral Monday movement. Uh, but nonetheless, there are many people who identify as Christian evangelicals who for a variety of reasons have found themselves very much in the camp of the right wing, which now really has just evolved into more of a, a far right movement. Um, as far as, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, some of those individuals and organizations have also played a powerful role in promoting far right and fascist political movements in Europe. And um, we were talking earlier about a report that a website called Open Democracy published uh, two months ago. 
about the role of some of these groups. So I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. Maybe when we talk about um, uh, in relation to the, uh, the activities of Steve Bannon. But I'd say as far as for support for Israel, that again is something that has a lot of conf confused, a lot of confusion and a lot of hypocrisy within it. Uh, because it's a lot of the same individuals and organizations who have historically been anti-Semitic. Uh, a lot of them that if they were around in the 1930s would have been leading the charge against uh, allowing any Jewish refugees into the United States, um, yet uh, find themselves loudly supporting Israel. Sometimes it's for reasons just of a convergence of uh, interest. Of, of interest. Yeah. And then, and sometimes among uh, Christians and evangelicals, it sometimes has its roots in a certain theological idea about the necessity for a Jewish state um, yeah. for the second coming of Jesus and mm -hmm. so on like this. Now, wh why is uh, Islamophobia being on the rise in the United States? And what is its relation to racism and Trumpism? And does Islamophobia in the U.S. differ from Islamophobia in countries such as France and Germany? Yeah, I would say that uh, actually it does differ uh, in some ways, especially from Germany and France, which are two countries that I'm particularly familiar with, uh, having lived for a long time in Berlin and also following developments there, both political developments and developments in relation to racism and Islamophobia. I'd say in those countries there's more, much more of a, uh, of, of a secular basis to it. That doesn't really help very much if you're the victim of Islamophobia and xenophobia. But often it's people in France who call themselves progressives and even socialists yeah. can be the loudest Islamophobes uh, because they claim that a certain their idea of France is um, you know, supposed to be secular and that you're supposed to not have any other identities other than some secular French identity. Um, to me, I find that all extremely distasteful because while these same people in some places such as France will claim that they don't care for any religions, that they just want, believe that society should be secular, in reality their animus is always directed at Muslims and at uh, Islam. And similarly in the U.S., some secular Islamophobes, like there's a rather unfunny comedian named Bill, uh, uh, Bill Meyer, who's one of the, the, the uh, uh, you know, uh, Leading, uh, yeah. the loudest uh, Islamophobes. And he calls himself some kind of a liberal who just doesn't like religion. But again, all of his hostility is against, uh, is against Islam. But I'd say that in, 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 in both contexts, in, in Western and Northern Europe and, other, and Eastern Europe and in the U.S., there's just a lot of connections between that racism and Islamophobia and xenophobia, that is, yeah. really sustain and promote Islamophobia in ways that, again, sometimes are very similar to the way that anti-Semitism has found sustenance in racism, xenophobia, certain ideas about uh, the Christian nature of th this or that country. And so, for example, right now, a lot of the alliances between uh, racist and Islamophobes in the U.S. and Europe are sometimes based around the idea of we must defend Christian Europe from the invasion of the Muslims and so on like this. Right. Now, you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier uh, former White House, White House strategist Steve, Steve Bannon. Mm -hmm. uh, he has been cultivating cozy ties with some European far-right politicians yeah. uh, and particularly with Balkan nationalists. Yeah. Uh, what exactly is he trying to achieve? Yeah, I'd say one thing he's trying to achieve is he wants to kind of be the, the ringleader and at the forefront of a global alliance of far-rightists. Uh, really a fascist, ultranationalist, and, and racist. How relevant is Steve mm -hmm. Bannon today? He is still relevant within the U.S. and in Europe, and some of his relevance and his uh, influence could be seen, I think, in the elections a few days ago, although sometimes it's hard to gauge exactly how much of that has to do with Bannon. He's very much of a self-promoter and so on. But he's also very active in running around and, for example, coming over here and meeting with the likes of, uh, of Dodik and, uh, and, and, and... Yeah, exactly. And, um, and inviting them, and he's met with both of them in, in, in Washington in the last year, as well as meeting them over here. He was involved in the elections that took place in your country last fall, uh, again, in supporting uh, the far-rightists in the Republika Srpska. So um, some people in the U.S., I think, uh, underestimate his importance because he was removed from the Trump White House at a certain point in 2017, largely just because of a, of a ego clash between these two people. Trump doesn't like to have someone else t t taking away too much of the spotlight from himself. But in fact, they've continued to, to work together, and Bannon is still carrying out the same project that he had been with Trump, which is to uh, promote alliances of far-rightists. Uh, 
especially in Europe and the United States. And of course, he's met many times, uh, very you know, with people like Marine Le Pen and, and, and many others of that sort. I think he also has a particular interest, uh, I think, in the Balkans, just because he sees it as a hotbed of right-wing nationalism. And there's, again, as a convergence of interest, because people like Dodik would like to have support for one of their aims of, uh, of the succession of the so-called Republika Srpska. And, uh, and Trump is also, uh, that is, Bannon is also aligned with politicians in France, Austria, and elsewhere. And Russia. And, and Russia, yeah. who would also, uh, are, are quite favorable to that. All right. John mm -hmm. Cox, it was a pleasure speaking to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your yeah, time. Yeah, thank you very much. Havala and, and good day. Poštovani gledalci, bio je to John Cox, profesor sa Univerziteta u Sjevernoj Karolini. Rusija je svjesna da je jačanje nacionalizma dijelomično doprinjelo raspadu Sovjetskog savjeza. Danas, nacionalizam se pokazao kao koristan instrument za dezintegraciju Evropske unije, a slom evropskog poredka je u ruskom interesu, jer historijski gledano, snažan evropski poredak značio je slabiju Rusiju i obratno. Skoro 30 godina nakon raspada Sovjetskog saveza, ruska nacionalistička ideja i vanjsko-politički intervencionizam sovjetskog tipa ponovo se vraća na scenu. Poštovani gledalci, bilo je to sve u ovom izdanju emisije Granice Istoka. Ukoliko ste propustili bilo koji dio, cijelu emisiju možete pogledati na našoj internetskoj stranici balkans.aljazira.net. Hvala na pažnji.